Memorial Park was established in 1989. Under the stewardship of Mayor Gene Killian, the city of Arcadia purchased land that would eventually become home to Soldiers Walk, an aquatic center, athletic fields, a kids' play area, Kids' Kingdom, a visitor center, and additional public facilities for hosting family and community events. All of these facilities, the memorial, and all of the trees and benches throughout the park were donated. Ron Wanick, founder and chairman of Ashley Furniture Industries, along with Ashley Furniture's contributions, approximately $10 million, not including their time, which is estimated to be approximately 30,000 hours. Families honoring veterans and other loved ones have donated trees, benches, and other memorials in the park as well. The Arcadia Lions Club donated the Soldiers Walk Visitor Center, the pavilion, and the monstrous barbecue pit, considered one of the largest indoor barbecue pits in the country. Soldiers Walk got its start from Ron Wanick's original idea, to build a memorial to Vietnam, just one monument modeled after the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. A lot of Ron's friends were in Vietnam, and he didn't like the way they were treated when they came home. The idea behind the memorial was to honor those who served in Vietnam, to give them the recognition they deserved. After the Vietnam Memorial, Ron had an idea for a concrete ribbon through the park that would honor America's conflicts and those that served. A timeline of sorts, a walk through history. This became Soldier's Walk with 28 monuments depicting 43 people in all. An impressive statue of George Washington, America's only six-star general, resides on the northwest corner of the park in the Soldier's Walk Rotunda. The rotunda also has monuments that pay tribute to the Mexican-American War and the War of 1812. Nearby, there are statues honoring POWs and MIAs. As you stroll through the walk, you will see monuments honoring the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, the Spanish-American War, Teddy Roosevelt, World War I, World War II, the Iwo Jima Memorial, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and the Persian Gulf War. The final memorial you'll see on the walk is dedicated to the War on Terror when America was attacked on September 11, 2001. The memorial features an actual twisted steel beam from one of the Twin Towers that was recovered from the tragedy at Ground Zero in New York City shortly after 9-11. There is a Patriots Memorial, an eye-catching display of pillars topped by eagles at the entrance of the walk and a 30-foot high Angel of Mercy monument depicting a fallen soldier being lifted to heaven. It is made from a single piece of black marble weighing 50,000 pounds. Beautiful flower gardens are placed in front of each memorial in the middle of the walk, symbolizing the length of the conflict while honoring and respecting those who served during that time. If the conflict was four years, the garden would be four meters long. The garden in front of the Vietnam Memorial is 11 meters long, representing the 11-year conflict, our nation's longest. Individual memorial tributes from local families are positioned throughout the park, honoring family and loved ones. Memorials and statues paying tribute to the pioneers that settled America are also included along the walk. A memorial featuring a draft horse being led by a man who is being observed by a boy and his dog pays tribute to the early farmers who pioneered this great country. The man's face is a likeness of Ron Wanick's father, and the children are renderings of his two grandsons. Positioned directly behind this monument is a tribute to the pioneer women who also helped build this great country. It's a bronze statue of a woman caring for her children with assorted feathered friends. There is also a fountain built into the memorial. The likeness of the faces pay tribute to Ron Wanick's mother and his granddaughters. Behind those monuments is the Millennium Amphitheater. The amphitheater is a 2,000-seat outdoor theater that is used throughout the spring, summer, and fall to host large community events both day and night. One such event is the Ashley for the Arts, held the second Saturday of every August. The music, art, and charity event draws more than 30,000 people and supports more than 20 nonprofit organizations. Performing artists have included the Beach Boys and Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. The amphitheater was inspired by Arlington National Cemetery. It was funded by a $1 million donation. The area behind the main stage is adorned with 2,000 bricks celebrating the year 2000, the new millennium, each of which can be purchased as a donation to the park and have custom inscriptions to memorialize individual events, birthdays, and more. The top fringe of the amphitheater is anchored by General's Overlook. 
This is a memorial designed to honor America's greatest generals. Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, is the tallest statue. It depicts Eisenhower as he is giving final instructions to the troops prior to D-Day. General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the Pacific Forces, is depicted as he is waiting ashore upon his re-entry into the Philippines. John, Black Jack Pershing, commander of the Expeditionary Forces in World War I, is depicted landing on the shores of Europe. You will also find statues of Ulysses S. Grant, our great Civil War general, Admiral Perry, John Paul Jones, also known as the father of the U.S. Navy. You will also find a statue dedicated to General George Patton with his bull terrier Willie at the base. Patton is depicted giving orders to his troops at Bastogne during Battle of the Bulge. General's Overlook also features the American flag at the top of the amphitheater and the five flags for the five branches of service acting as a fitting backdrop to the end of the walk. Up on the hill above the amphitheater, you will find the first non-commissioned F-16. It was decommissioned in 1992. The F-16 is known because it has been flown by the United States Air Force Thunderbirds. You will also find two 155 howitzers and a tank. Washington is referred to as the father of our country, and we all know that he led the efforts of the colonies against the British in the American Revolutionary War. The memorial was modeled after the memorial to George Washington at the West Point Military Academy, near the entrance of Washington Hall. Washington Hall is the home of the West Point Cadets Mess Hall, several school departments, and the office of the Commandant. The statue depicts Washington greeting his troops as he enters into Valley Forge. On this statue, you'll see some of this man's achievements and the dates associated with those achievements. Most notably, that he is America's only six-star general, a commission Congress bestowed upon him in 1976 during our bicentennial. This honor made sure that Washington would always rank above all other American generals. In our entire history, we've only had nine five-star hero commanders, generals, or admirals. When you enter the rotunda, you'll be greeted to a statue and memorial honoring the American Revolutionary War, which was fought from 1775 to 1783. Also known as the American War of Independence, the Revolutionary War began with a confrontation between British troops and local militia at Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts on April 19, 1775. The conflict arose from the growing tensions between residents of Great Britain's 13 North American colonies and the colonial government, which represented the British Crown. Throughout the war, state troops and local militias supplemented the Continental or the Federal Army. The total number of men who served is not known. Men between the ages of 16 and 60 may have served during the war in either the Continental Army, state line troops, or local militia mustered to help the Continental troops. In 1775, when the American Revolution began, there was no regular army. Instead, each colony defended itself with a militia made up of local men. With few exceptions, any male 16 or older was expected to participate in the militia. By 1776, Washington had an army of 20,000 men. About one-third came from colonial militia groups, and two-thirds were regular army. France entered the American Revolution on the side of the colonists in 1778, turning what had essentially been a civil war into an international conflict. After French assistance helped the Continental Army force the British surrender at Yorktown, Virginia in 1781, the Americans had effectively won their independence, though fighting would not formally end until 1783. When you enter the rotunda, you will notice a statue in honor of Thaddeus Kosciuszko, Kosciuszko was a Polish military engineer and a military leader who became a national hero in Poland, Belarus, and the United States. In 1776, Kosciuszko moved to North America, where he took part in the American Revolutionary War as a colonel in the Continental Army. An accomplished military architect, he designed and oversaw the construction of state-of-the-art fortifications, including those at West Point, New York. 
In 1783, in recognition of his services, the Continental Congress promoted him to Brigadier General. This statue is in honor of his service during the Revolutionary War and as a tribute to the Polish-American heritage of Arcadia, Wisconsin. One of the first statues you'll see depicts a United States soldier in full battle dress. The uniform was stunning and is still used as the model for West Point cadets at the West Point Military Academy. Many Americans are not familiar with this war between the U.S. and Mexico. The war lasted two years, but it was 15 years in the making due to unstable politics in Mexico and Mexico's resentment of the U.S. populating Texas. On the memorial, you will see a synopsis of the conflict, why it happened, and the dates of the conflicts. As you stroll down the walk, on your right side will be the statue depicting Abraham Lincoln from the Civil War era. The statue was designed showing Lincoln giving his Gettysburg Address. Lincoln was born on February 12, 1809, and was our 16th President of the United States, serving from March 1861 until his assassination on April 15, 1865. Lincoln led the United States through its Civil War, its bloodiest war and its greatest moral, constitution, and political crisis. In doing so, he preserved the Union, abolished slavery, strengthened the national government, and modernized the economy. Lincoln had warned the South in his inaugural address, quote, In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. End quote. On the statue, there are many interesting facts about Lincoln the man and facts about the Civil War. Most notably, the size of the population of the North at 22,400,000 versus the South with a total population of 9,103,000. The North's army outnumbered the South's army by 2 to 1. These facts, along with other notable facts embedded on the monument, one would think the South was undertaking a war they couldn't win, even though both sides suffered equal amount of casualties. Lincoln thought secession illegal and was willing to use force to defend federal law and the Union. When Confederate batteries fired on Fort Sumner and forced its surrender, he called on the states for 75,000 volunteers. Four more slave states joined the Confederacy, but four remained within the Union. The Civil War had begun. On January 1, 1863, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation that declared forever free those slaves within the Confederacy. After the bloody Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address of 1863 became an iconic statement of America's dedication to the principles of nationalism, republicanism, equal rights, liberty, and democracy. It was delivered by Lincoln during the American Civil War on the afternoon of Thursday, November 19, 1863, at the dedication of the Soldiers' National Cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Four and a half months after the Union armies defeated those of the Confederacy at the Battle of Gettysburg. On Good Friday, April 14, 1865, Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater in Washington by John Wilkes Booth, an actor who somehow thought he was helping the South. The opposite was the result, for with Lincoln's death, the possibility of peace with generosity of spirit died. As you enter the park from the Visitor Center, you will see perched atop the POW and MIA memorials, the American Eagle. One of the most iconic symbols of the United States of America is the American Bald Eagle. You will notice this tribute on the POW MIA memorials entering the park. The Bald Eagle was chosen on June 20, 1782 as the emblem of the United States of America. It was chosen because of its long life, great strength, and majestic looks, and also because it was then believed to exist only on this continent. At the Second Continental Congress, after the 13 colonies voted to declare independence from Great Britain, the colonies determined they needed an official seal. So Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, serving on a committee, prepared a device for the seal of the United States of America. However, the only portion of the design accepted by Congress was the statement E Pluribus Unum. Out of many states or colonies emerges a single nation. That saying is attributed to Thomas Jefferson. The eagle became the national emblem in 1782 when the Great Seal of the United States was adopted. The Great Seal shows a widespread eagle, faced front, having on his breast a shield with 13 perpendicular red and white stripes. 
surmounted by a blue field with the same number of stars. In his right talon, the eagle holds an olive branch, in his left a bundle of 13 arrows, and in his beak he carries a scroll inscribed with the motto, E Pluribus Unum. Six years and two committees later, in May of 1782, the brother of a Philadelphia naturalist provided a drawing showing an eagle displayed as the symbol of supreme power and authority. Congress liked the drawing, so before the end of 1782, an eagle holding a bundle of arrows in one tail and an olive branch in the other was accepted as the seal. The image was completed with a shield of red and white stripes covering the breast of the bird, a crest above the eagle's head with a cluster of 13 stars surrounded by bright rays going out to a ring of clouds, and a banner held by the eagle in its bill bearing the words E Pluribus Unum. Yet it was not until 1787 that the American bald eagle was officially adopted as the emblem of the United States. This happened only after many states had already used the eagle in their coat of arms, as New York State did in 1778. Though the official seal has undergone some modifications in the last 200 years, the basic design is the same. On the back of our gold coins, the silver dollar, the half dollar, and the quarter, we see an eagle with outspread wings. On the great seal of the United States, and in many places which are exponents of our nation's authority, we see the same emblem. The eagle represents freedom. Living as he does on the tops of lofty mountains, amid the solitary grandeur of nature, he has unlimited freedom. Whether with strong pinions he sweeps into the valleys below or upward into the boundless spaces beyond. Eagles can be seen everywhere around Arcadia, Wisconsin, and as you travel along Highway 61 along the Mississippi River, their majestic presence is always awe inspiring. But there is another story about this majestic bird, one whose name was Old Abe from the Civil War and now adorns the U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Screaming Eagle insignia. The story of Old Abe begins when he was purchased from an American Indian chief, Chief Sky. He was later resold for $2.50 to Captain John E. Perkins, commanding officer of a militia company called the Eau Claire Badgers. Part of the money was, reluctantly, given by local tavern keepers. In light of their newly acquired mascot, the unit renamed themselves the Eau Claire Eagles. During its time awaiting muster into the Federal Service at Camp Randall, the 8th Wisconsin Volunteer Infantry Regiment purchased a special shield-shaped perch on which to carry their new mascot. Here, in Madison, Wisconsin, where Old Abe was named in honor of our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. Old Abe would purchase himself on the unit's cannon during many Civil War battles. During one such battle, seeing Old Abe atop his perch during the Battle of Corneth, Mississippi, Confederate General Sterling Price remarked, That bird must be captured or killed at all hazards. I would rather get that eagle than capture a whole brigade or a dozen battle flags. The Wisconsin War Eagles post-life war was punctuated by frequent nationwide travel in support of veteran reunions, patriotic gatherings, soldier relief benefits, and special exhibitions during which he achieved a rock star-like status. In 1876, Old Abe again toured the country as part of America's Centennial Exposition. Today, Old Abe is honored with the Screaming Eagle insignia of the 101st Airborne Division, perhaps the most recognized and famous shoulder sleeve insignia in the United States Army. On the left side of the walk, after leaving the rotunda, you will see a statue of Theodore Teddy Roosevelt. He is standing on the memorial of the Spanish-American War. Theodore Roosevelt was born on October 27, 1858, into a wealthy family in New York City. Known as Teddy, he was frail and sickly as a boy, and as a teenager, followed a program of gymnastics and weightlifting to build up his strength. Roosevelt embraced a strenuous lifestyle and successfully regained his health. He integrated his exuberant personality, vast range of interests, and world-famous achievements into a cowboy persona defined by robust masculinity. Following the deaths of his wife and mother on the same day in 1884, he escaped to the wilderness and operated a cattle ranch in the Dakotas. He returned to runs unsuccessfully for mayor of New York City in 1886. He served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy under William McKinley, resigning after one year to serve with the Rough Riders in the Spanish-American War. During the Spanish-American War, Roosevelt was a lieutenant colonel of the Rough Rider Regiment which he led on a charge at the Battle of San Juan. He was one of the most conspicuous heroes of the war. Returning a war hero, he was elected governor of New York in 1898. 
a frustrated party establishment made him McKinley's running mate in the election of 1900. He campaigned vigorously across the country, helping McKinley win re-election by a landslide on a platform of peace, prosperity, and conservation. The assassination of President McKinley in September 1901 meant that at age 42, Roosevelt had become President of the United States, the youngest president in history at that time. Leading his party and country into the progressive era, he championed his square deal domestic policies, promising the average citizen fairness, breaking of trust using the Sherman Antitrust Act, the regulation of railroads, and pure food and drugs. Making conservation a top priority, he established a myriad of new national parks, forests, and monuments in order to preserve the nation's natural resources. In June 1902, the National Reclamation Act, dedicated to large-scale irrigation projects in the American West, became the first major legislative achievement of his presidency. In addition, Roosevelt set aside almost 200 million acres of land, almost five times as much land as all his predecessors combined, for national forests, reserves, and wildlife refuge. In foreign policy, Roosevelt concentrated on Central America, where he began construction of the Panama Canal. Like McKinley, Roosevelt sought to bring the United States out of its isolationism and fulfill its responsibility as a world power. He believed that America should speak softly and carry a big stick in the realm of international affairs and that his president should be willing to use force to back up his diplomatic negotiations. Roosevelt followed this big stick policy most conspicuously in his dealings in Latin America. In 1903, he helped Panama secede from Colombia in order to facilitate the beginning of construction on the Panama Canal, which he later claimed as his greatest accomplishment as president. He also greatly expanded the United States Navy and sent the Great White Fleet on a world tour to project the United States naval power. His successful efforts to the end of the Russo-Japanese War won him the 1906 Nobel Peace Prize. Roosevelt was elected in 1904 to a full term. During his presidency, Roosevelt successfully groomed his close friend William Howard Taft for the presidency. After leaving office, he went on a safari in Africa and toured Europe. Returning to the USA, he became very frustrated with Taft's approach as his successor, trying but failing to win the nomination in 1912. He founded his own party, the Progressive Bull Moose Party, and called for wide-ranging progressive reforms. Frustrated at home, Roosevelt led a two-year expedition in the Amazon, nearly dying of tropical disease. During World War I, he opposed President Wilson for keeping the U.S. out of the war against Germany and offered his military services, which were never summoned. Although he planned to run again for president in 1920, his health quickly deteriorated, and he died in his sleep on January 6, 1919, at his family home in Oyster Bay, New York, at the age of 60. Roosevelt has consistently been ranked by scholars as one of the greatest U.S. presidents of the United States. His face adorns Mount Rushmore, along those of Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln. The memorial depicting World War I, or the First World War, on Soldier's Walk shows an American soldier holding his rifle, getting ready to throw a grenade. The memorial has two sides of information pertaining to this war that was known as the war that would end all wars. The First World War started on June 28, 1914, and ended on June 21, 1919. The United States did not enter the war until April 6, 1917, almost three years after the war started. Embedded into the walk in front of the monument are granite plaques paying tribute to local area veterans who served in this war. On the front of the memorial, you'll find the statistics of the countries involved in the war and the casualties suffered, which was a staggering number. For instance, 65,038,810 soldiers were mobilized for this war, of which 4,355,000 were American troops. 8,538,315 were killed in action. 126,000 of those were Americans. 21,219,452 soldiers were wounded in action, of which 234,300 were Americans, 
and 7,750,919 were declared either POW or missing in action, including 4,500 Americans. It should be noted that the actual casualty statistics for World War I vary to a great extent. Estimates of the total deaths range from 9 million to over 15 million, ranking it among the deadliest conflicts in human history. The casualty rate was exasperated by technological and industrial sophistication and tactical stalemates. It was the fifth deadliest conflict in history, paving the way for major political changes, including revolutions in many of the nations that were involved. World War I was a global war, centered in Europe, that began on the 28th of July, 1914, and lasted until November 11th, 1918. From the time of its occurrence until the approach of World War II, it was simply called the World War, or the Great War, and thereafter the First World War, or World War I. In America, it was initially called the European War. Since the beginning of World War I in 1914, the United States under President Woodrow Wilson had maintained strict neutrality, other than providing material assistance to the Allies. Even in May 1915, when a German submarine sank the British ocean liner Lusitania, killing 128 U.S. citizens out of a total of 1,200 dead, the United States, though in an uproar, remained neutral. In January 1917, Germany announced that it would lift all restrictions on submarine warfare starting on February 1st. This declaration meant that German U-boat commanders were suddenly authorized to sink all ships that they believed to be providing aid of any sort to the Allies. Because the primary goal was to starve Britain into surrendering, the German effort would focus largely on ships crossing the Atlantic from the United States and Canada. The first victim of this new policy was the American cargo ship Housatonic, which a German U-boat sank on February 3, 1917. Although Wilson tried hard to keep the United States neutral, by the spring of 1917, the situation had changed significantly and neutrality no longer seemed feasible. Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare was taking its toll as American ships, both cargo and passenger, were sunk one after the other. Finally, on April 2nd, Wilson appeared before Congress and requested a declaration of war. Congress responded within days, officially declaring war on Germany on April 6th, 1917. The war officially ended at 11 o'clock in the morning, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. History notes this day as Armistice Day, which was celebrated in the United States until June 1st, 1954, when Congress replaced it with Veterans Day. So what started it all? Though tensions had been brewing in Europe, and especially in the troubled Balkan region, for years before conflict actually broke out, the spark that ignited World War I was struck in Sarajevo, Bosnia, where Archduke Franz Ferdinand, nephew of Emperor Franz Joseph, and heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was shot to death along with his wife by Serbian nationalists on June 28, 1914. The assassination of Franz Ferdinand and Sophie set off a rapid chain of events. Austria-Hungary, like many countries in the world, blamed the Serbian government for the attack and hoped to use the incident as justification for settling the question of Slavic nationalism once and for all. As Russia supported Serbia, Austria-Hungary waited to declare war until its leaders received assurances from German leader Kaiser Wilhelm II that Germany would support their cause in the event of a Russian intervention. Their main concern was that such an action would likely involve Russia's ally, France, and possibly Great Britain as well. In the end, the pitted Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Ottoman Empire, the so-called Central Powers, against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, and Japan the Allied powers. After the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, an escalation of threats and mobilization orders followed the incident, leading by mid-August to the outbreak of World War I. The Allies were joined after 1917 by the United States. The four years of the Great War, as it was then known, saw unprecedented levels of carnage and destruction, thanks to grueling trench warfare and the introduction of modern weaponry, such as machine guns, tanks, and, of course, chemical weapons. By the time World War I ended and the defeat of the Central Powers in November 1918, more than 9 million soldiers had been killed and 21 million more wounded. The two nations most affected were Germany and France. 
each of which sent some 80% of their male populations between the ages of 15 and 49 into the battle. The war also marked the fall of four imperial dynasties, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Russia, and Turkey. At the peace conference in Paris in 1919, Allied leaders would state their desire to build a post-war world that would safeguard itself against future conflicts of such devastating scale. The Versailles Treaty, signed on June 28, 1919, would not achieve this objective. Saddled with war guilt and heavy reparations and denied entrance into the League of Nations, Germany felt tricked into signing the treaty, having believed any peace would be a peace without victory, as put forward by Wilson in his famous 14-point speech of January 1918. As the years passed, hatred of the Versailles Treaty and its authors settled into a smoldering resentment in Germany that would, two decades later, be counted among the primary cause of World War II and, of course, the rise of Hitler. John Joseph Blackjack Pershing John J. Pershing was the only person in history to hold the rank of General of the Armies while actually serving on active duty. In 1896, Pershing was assigned to the frontier with the 10th Cavalry, an all-black regiment. The Native American Indians called these troops Buffalo Soldiers because they believed the soldiers' hair resembled that of a buffalo. At the time, black soldiers were fully segregated from whites in the military. After that assignment, Pershing was then assigned to teach at West Point. Here he was given the nickname Black Jack because he had spent time with the 10th Cavalry, the all-black regiment. In 1919, to honor his service in World War I, Congress authorized the promotion of Pershing to the rank of General of the Armies of the United States and allowed him to design his own insignia. On September 3, 1919, President Woodrow Wilson, in accordance with Public Law 66-45, promoted Pershing to that same rank. The rank was primarily intended to recognize Pershing's performance as commander of the American Expeditionary Forces. The wording of Pershing's new rank was to distinguish that this held authority over all the armed services, as opposed to the Civil War title, General of the Army, which was itself only an army rank. General Pershing chose to wear the four stars of a general, but in gold, to signify his new position. A bureaucratic loophole in army regulations did not recognize this insignia, Thus, Pershing's gold stars did not appear on Army rank precedence charts and were considered as an unofficial rank insignia. The matter was not resolved until after Pershing's retirement, when the Army declared that the four gold stars won by Pershing were the official insignia for General of the Armies of the United States at that time, thus creating the following hierarchy of Army General Officer ranks. General Douglas MacArthur a five-star general and commander of the Pacific Forces in World War II. Douglas MacArthur was born at the Little Rock Army Barracks in Arkansas, where he began his life of discipline with the United States Army. His parents were Civil War hero Lieutenant General Arthur MacArthur and Mary Pickney Hardy MacArthur. Douglas would grow up to be a highly intelligent, heroic, egotistical, and controversial five-star general. Young Douglas soon learned that a MacArthur must first become a scholar and then a gentleman. At the age of six, Douglas transferred with his family to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Then three years later to Washington, D.C., where his father, Captain MacArthur, took a post in the War Department. MacArthur began his education at the West Texas Military Academy in 1893 and gained many valuable intellectual skills. He received an appointment to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1898. After four years, Douglas finished at West Point first in his 93-person class. In 1904, MacArthur was promoted to first lieutenant for excellence, achieved while working in the Philippines with the Army Corps of Engineers. Because of his service there, he soon found himself touring Asia with his father. In World War I, MacArthur commanded the 42nd Rainbow Division on the Western Front of France. He put together the 42nd Division by accumulating National Guard units before the war. He and his men fought with determined loyalty and courage, gaining a sense of superior fighting prowess. MacArthur became the first decorated American soldier of World War I. His mission successfully completed, and after sustaining two combat wounds, MacArthur earned 13 decorations and was cited seven additional times for bravery. 
In August 1918, upon his promotion to Brigadier General, the youngest ever in the Army, MacArthur became the commander of the 84th Infantry Brigade. Three months later, at the age of 38, he became the youngest divisional commander in France. Following the war, MacArthur returned to West Point, being appointed the youngest superintendent in the institution's 117 years of existence. Upon entering World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt named MacArthur commander of all U.S. Army forces in the Far East in July 1941. While preparing the U.S. military for the Philippine Islands' full independence scheduled for 1946, MacArthur would soon find out just how cunning and powerful the Japanese could be in the Pacific. Despite General Dwight D. Eisenhower's direct assistance from Washington, MacArthur did not have the resources to build a force capable of holding off the Japanese. The attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, and subsequent attacks in the Philippines where he was stationed was the crushing point of MacArthur's army in the Philippines. His army and air force were quickly pulverized, and by January, the remainders of his men were forced onto the Bataan Peninsula. While his forces struggled to survive, MacArthur could only watch from his command on the island of Caricador at the mouth of Manila Bay. In March 1942, President Roosevelt made MacArthur commander of the Allied forces in the Southwest Pacific and ordered him to go to Australia. Under cover of night, a U.S. Navy torpedo boat spirited MacArthur and his family from Corregidor to the southern Philippines. They flew to Australia from there. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor on April 1, 1942. It was in Australia that he uttered his famous promise, I shall return. For the next three years, Douglas MacArthur would fight for his promise. MacArthur spent much of 1942 accumulating men and material. Later that year, he commenced his mighty offensive against the Japanese. By early 1944, his soldiers were victorious in most of New Guinea, New Britain, the Solomons, and the Admiralty Islands. On October 20, 1944, his forces invaded Leyte Island in the Philippines. He trudged ashore with his men at Leyte. By doing so, MacArthur fulfilled his promise to return. Six months later, all of the Philippines were liberated from the Japanese. MacArthur was promoted to five-star general of the Army in December 1944. In 1945, he took command of all American Army forces in the Pacific. On August 14th of that year, President Truman announced the Japanese surrender and made MacArthur supreme commander of the Allied powers. It became MacArthur's job to receive the surrender and to rule Japan. The Japanese surrender took place aboard the battleship Missouri on September 2nd, 1945. Five years later, the Korean War began. After North Korean communists invaded South Korea in 1950, MacArthur was appointed the Supreme United Nations Commander. After the Chinese communists entered the war on the side of the North Koreans, MacArthur wanted to attack the Chinese mainland. His enthusiasm for pushing on and attacking areas of China was not shared with President Truman. On April 11, 1951, MacArthur was relieved of his command by the president. MacArthur, always straightforward with his opinions, had publicly disagreed with Washington's campaign strategies, which in the American system of government, military leaders are not permitted to do. General Matthew B. Ridgway replaced MacArthur and stabilized the military situation near the 38th parallel. After nursing thoughts of a run at the White House, MacArthur finally gave up on the idea in 1952. New York was home for MacArthur's remaining 12 years of life, where he analyzed and wrote on many public issues. He passed away at Walter Reed Army Hospital on April 14, 1964, at the age of 84. The world has turned over many times. Since I took the oath on the plane at West Point, and the hopes and dreams have long since vanished. But I still remember the refrain of one of the most popular barrack ballads of that day, which proclaimed most proudly that old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballad, I now close my military career 
and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. As you continue down the park on the left side, you will see a memorial honoring the 32nd Red Arrow Division, honoring their service in World War I. The division's history has an honored past reaching back to its beginnings, the fighters of the Black Hawk War, and the volunteers who marched off to defend the Union in the Civil War, including the famous Iron Brigade and the Governor's Guards, who mobilized for the Spanish-American War. Almost all of the Michigan and Wisconsin National Guard units, which would be combined to form the 32nd Division, had served in the Mexican Border War in 1916 and 1917. The division served on the front line during World War I from May 18, 1918, until the end of the war on November 11, 1918. It was the first American division to pierce the famed Hindenburg Line, fought in four major offensives, and earned the name La Terre Blah, from the French. The 32nd Division was the only American division to be bestowed with a no de gar by an Allied nation during the war. The colors of all four infantry regiments, three artillery regiments, and the three machine gun battalions were decorated with the French Croix de Guerre for the Palm. These were the only National Guard units bestowed with this highest honor by the French during World War I. The division served with the Army of Occupation in Germany until April 18, 1919, and began its return to the U.S. on May 1, 1919. But it doesn't end here for the heroes of the 32nd Red Arrow Infantry Division. In World War II, it could be argued the 32nd had more battle time than any other division during the war, over 654 days, which represents 48% of the total time the U.S. was in World War II. Some of the decorations and awards the 32nd received, 11 medals of honor, 9 awarded posthumously, 157 distinguished service crosses, 845 silver stars, 49 legions of merit, 78 soldiers medals, 1,854 bronze stars, 11,500 purple hearts, and 98 air medals. As you continue down the walk, you cannot miss the memorials for World War II. The modern world is still living with the consequences of World War II, the most titanic conflict in history. Coming just two decades after the last great global conflict, the Second World War was the most widespread and deadliest war in history, involving more than 30 countries. Casualties are the brutal reality of warfare. World War II was the deadliest military conflict in history, in absolute terms of total dead. 17 million civilians died and 16 million soldiers gave their lives in this conflict. There are two sets of memorials flanking on both sides of Soldier Walk to articulate the sheer size and scope of World War II. The Iwo Jima Memorial depicts the historic moment of the American flag being raised on the island of Iwo Jima. On the south side of the walk, you were first greeted with a plaque in the concrete memorializing those local men that fought in World War II. As you look up, you'll see the first monument that briefly summarizes the war. On the back side of that monument is a tribute to Walter Becker, a local man from Independence, Wisconsin, who was the most decorated World War II veteran in the area. Becker was a tank platoon leader in the Army's 2nd Armored Division, also known as Hell on Wheels, serving under General George S. Patton. The 2nd Armored Division participated in the invasions of North Africa and Sicily and the liberation of France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and the invasion of Germany. Becker had three tanks blown out from under him, and the only wound he suffered was when he accidentally cut his knee on a cotter pin on one of his tanks. Becker had three tanks blown out from under him, and the only wound he suffered was when he accidentally cut his knee on a cotter pin when he was coming down off one of his tanks. He walked with a limp his whole life and refused to receive any type of disability for his wound because, as he said, if I would have been paying attention, the accident would never have happened. Becker was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, 
two silver stars, one with five bronze service clusters, American Defense Service Medal, and many, many more heroic accommodations. Behind this monument that's surrounded by benches, you can sit and read the enormous amount of educational information and strategic maps that are inscribed in this memorial. You will see the primary memorial is divided into four sections. Left to right, the first section shows the map of the world where the United States gave Lend-Lease aid throughout the world and how much we gave to each country. Americans did not want to enter into a new war and instead gave financial and military aid to those involved in the conflicts. That was called Lend-Lease. The next section of the memorial is dedicated to the European theater. It explains key moments that led up to World War II and shows the geographical divisions of the Allied powers versus the Nazi regime. The third part of the memorial is dedicated to the Pacific Theater. It is an intricate map showing how the Japanese plan to take over Asia and has key strategic information inscribed in the memorial. The fourth and final part of the memorial is dedicated to the North African campaign. It is titled Seesaw Across the Continent depicting key battles and strategies that took place in this region. Patton took full command of the Corps, directing ideas, procedures, and even the design of their uniforms. Using his first-hand knowledge of tanks, Patton organized the American Tank School in Bourges, France and trained the first 500 American tankers. Patton had 345 tanks by the time he took the brigade into Moose Argon operation in September 1918. When they entered into battle, Patton had worked out a plan where he could be in the front lines maintaining communications with his rear command post by means of pigeons and a group of runners. Patton continually exposed himself to gunfire and was shot once in the leg while he was directing the tanks. His actions during that battle earned him the Distinguished Service Cross for Heroism, one of the many medals he would collect during his lifetime. When the German Blitzkrieg began in Europe, Patton finally convinced Congress that the United States needed a more powerful armored striking force. The formation of the armored force in 1940, he was transferred to the 2nd Armored Division at Fort Benning, Georgia, and named Commanding General on April 11, 1941. Two months later, Patton appeared on the cover of Life magazine. Also during this time, Patton began giving his famous blood and gut speeches in an amphitheater he had built to accommodate the entire division. By November 8, 1942, Patton was commanding the Western Task Force, the only American force landing for Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of North Africa. After succeeding there, Patton commanded the 7th Army during the invasion of Sicily in July 1943, and in conjunction with the British, 8th Army restored Sicily to its citizens. Patton commanded the 7th Army until 1944, when he was given command of the 3rd Army in France. Patton and his troops dashed across Europe after the Battle of Normandy and exploited German weaknesses with great success, covering the 600 miles across France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. When the Third Army liberated Buchenwald concentration camp, Patton slowed his pace. He instituted a policy, later adopted by other commanders, of making local German civilians tour the camps. By the time World War II was over, the Third Army had liberated or conquered 81,522 square miles of territory. In October 1945, Patton assumed command of the 15th Army in the American-occupied Germany. December 9, 1945, he suffered injuries as the result of an automobile accident. Patton died 12 days later, on December 21, 1945. He is buried among the soldiers who died in the Battle of the Bulge in Ham, Luxembourg. Remembered for his fierce determination and ability to lead soldiers, Patton is now considered one of the greatest military figures in history. The 1970 film Patton, starring George C. Scott in the title role, provoked renewed interest in Patton. The movie won seven Academy Awards, including Best Actor and Best Picture, and immortalized General George Smith Patton Jr. as one of the world's most intriguing military men of all time. The next memorial you will find on the left is the Memorial to the Battle of Iwo Jima, replicating a scene that is familiar to everyone, four soldiers erecting the American flag on top of Mount Suribachi. The memorial is 32 feet high and just a bit smaller than the memorial in Washington, D.C. The faces on the statue represent two local boys that fought on Iwo Jima, Russell Severson and Gerald Zemi. 
On this memorial, you'll find inscribed key moments associated with the battle, World War II, and more. The American amphibious invasion of Iwo Jima, a key island in the Bonin chain, roughly 575 miles from the Japanese coast, was sparked by the desire for a place where B-29 bombers that were damaged over Japan could land, and for a base for escort fighters that would assist in the bombing campaign. Iwo Jima is a small speck in the Pacific. It is 4.5 miles long and at its broadest point 2.5 miles wide. Iwo is the Japanese word for sulfur, and the island is indeed full of sulfur. Yellow sulfuric mist routinely rises from the cracks of the earth, and the island distinctly smells like rotten eggs. Since winning Saipan in the previous year, American bomber commander Curtis LeMay had been planning raids on the Japanese home islands from Saipan, and the first of such bombings took place in November 1944. The bombers, however, were threatened by Iwo Jima in two ways. First, the Zero fighters based on Iwo Jima physically threatened the bombers. Secondly, Iwo Jima also acted as an early warning station for Japan, giving Tokyo two hours of warning before the American bombers reached their targets. Moreover, the Japanese could, and did, launch aerial operations against Saipan from Iwo Jima. Finally, the United States could gain an additional airfield for future operations against Japan, if Iwo Jima could be captured. In the Philippines, the operation on the island of Let was pushed up by eight weeks due to lack of significant resistance, which opened up a window for an additional operation. Thus, Operation Detachment against Iwo Jima was decided. A memorial to the Korean War will be on the left side as you continue down Soldier's Walk. The memorial depicts three soldiers, an American soldier with their bayonet ready, another American soldier throwing a grenade, and the third representing a South Korean soldier carrying ammunition. The memorial is a tribute to communist first defeat and shows where the action took place and the statistics of the conflict. It pays tribute to the 1,789,000 Americans who served and the 33,651 who were killed, the 13,000 and six POW MIAs, and the 103,284 veterans who were wounded in this conflict. The memorial was donated in remembrance of those who served in this conflict by a local Arcadia resident. The Korean War began as a civil war between North and South Korea, but the conflict soon became international when, under U.S. leadership, the United Nations joined to support South Korea while the People's Republic of China entered to aid North Korea. The war left Korea divided and brought the Cold War to Asia. The UN entry into the conflict led to a swift internationalization of what had been an internal struggle. Though the United States dedicated the greatest number of troops, soldiers from Australia, Belgium, Canada, Colombia, Ethiopia, France, Greece, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, New Zealand, the Philippines, South Africa, Thailand, Turkey, and the United Kingdom also sent troops. U.S. officials emphasized that this joint military action was imperative to prevent the conflict and communism from spreading outside Korea. The U.S. provided 88% of the 341,000 international soldiers which aided South Korean forces in this conflict. On General's Overlook, the statue and memorial that stands out above all others is that of five-star General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces during World War II. Born in Texas in 1890, brought up in Abilene, Kansas, Eisenhower was the third son of seven sons. He excelled in sports in high school and received an appointment to West Point. Stationed in Texas as a second lieutenant, he met Mamie Geneva Dowd, whom he married in 1916. A member of the star-studded class that would ultimately produce 59 generals, including Omar Bradley, Eisenhower was a solid student and graduated 61st in a class of 164. While at the academy, he also proved a gifted athlete until having his career cut short by a knee injury. Completing his education, Eisenhower graduated in 1915 and was assigned to the infantry. Eisenhower was one of a select few who obtained the rank of a five-star general on December 20, 1944. In his early Army career, Eisenhower excelled in staff assignments, serving under Generals John Blackjack Pershing, Douglas MacArthur, and Walter Kruger. 
Known as an excellent staff officer, Eisenhower was selected as aide by U.S. Army Chief of Staff General Douglas MacArthur. When MacArthur's term ended in 1935, Eisenhower followed his superior to the Philippines to serve as a military advisor to the Filipino government. Promoted to lieutenant colonel in 1936, Eisenhower began to clash with MacArthur on military and philosophical topics. Opening a rift that would last the remainder of their lives, the arguments led to Eisenhower to return to Washington in 1939 and take a series of staff positions. Becoming chief of the War Plans Division, he was soon elevated to assistant chief of staff, overseeing the operations division under chief of staff General George C. Marshall. Though he had never led large formations in the field, Eisenhower soon impressed Marshall with his organizational and leadership skills. As a result, Marshall appointed him commander of the European Theater of Operations on June 24, 1942. This was soon followed by a promotion to lieutenant general. After extensive planning, Eisenhower moved forward with the invasion of Normandy, Operation Overlord, on June 6, 1944. Successful, his forces broke out of the beachhead in July and began driving across France. Though he clashed with Churchill over strategy, Eisenhower worked to balance Allied initiatives and improve Montgomery's Operation Market Garden in September. Pushing east in December, Eisenhower's biggest crisis of the campaign came with the opening of the Battle of the Bulge on December 16th. With German forces breaking through the Allied lines, Eisenhower quickly worked to seal the breach and contain the enemy advance. Over the next month, Allied forces halted the enemy and drove them back to their original lines with heavy losses. During the fighting, Eisenhower was promoted to General of the Army. With the surrender of Germany on May 8, 1945, Eisenhower was named military governor of the U.S. occupation zone. As governor, he worked to document Nazi atrocities, deal with food shortages, and aid refugees. Returning to the United States that fall, Eisenhower was greeted as a hero. Made chief of staff on November 19th, he replaced Marshall and remained in this post until February 6, 1948. A key responsibility during his tenure was overseeing the rapid downsizing of the Army after the war. Departing in 1948, Eisenhower became president of Columbia University. While there, he worked to expand his political and economic knowledge, as well as he wrote his memoir, Crusade in Europe. In 1950, Eisenhower was recalled to be the Supreme Commander for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Serving until May 31, 1952, he retired from active duty and returned to Columbia University. Entering politics, Eisenhower ran for president that fall with Richard Nixon as his running mate. Winning in a landslide, he defeated Adlai Stevenson, a moderate Republican. Eisenhower's eight years in the White House were marked by the end of the Korean War, efforts to contain communism, construction of the interstate highway system, nuclear deterrence, founding of Nassau, and economic prosperity. Leaving office in 1961, Eisenhower retired to his farm in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. He lived in Gettysburg with his wife, Mamie, until his death from heart failure on March 28, 1969. Following funeral services in Washington, Eisenhower was buried in Abilene, Kansas at the Eisenhower Presidential Library. When you venture down the walk, you'll come across the Vietnam Memorial. The memorial is designed to replicate the National Memorial in Washington, D.C. It is made of black Indian granite. The Vietnam Memorial was the first memorial designed and placed in the Memorial Park. On the memorial, you'll notice that names depicted with a star actually fought in the conflict. Those names with a cross in front of their name died in the conflict. The other names of the memorial are people that served in the military during the war from the area. In front of the memorial, on the walk, you will see a beautifully maintained flower garden 11 meters long. Each meter of the garden reflects one year, and this war was 11 years long. The Vietnam War was a long, costly armed conflict that pitted the communist regime of North Vietnam and its southern allies, known as the Viet Cong, against South Vietnam and its principal ally, the United States. The actual war began in 1954, though conflict in the region stretched back to the mid-1940s. 
After the rise to power of Ho Chi Minh and his communist Viet Minh Party in North Vietnam, this conflict continued against the backdrop of an intense Cold War between two global superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. More than 3 million people, including 58,000 Americans, were killed in the Vietnam War. More than half were Vietnamese civilians. By 1969, at the peak of the U.S. involvement in the war, more than 500,000 U.S. military personnel were involved in the Vietnam conflict. Growing opposition to the war in the United States led to bitter divisions among Americans, both before and after President Nixon ordered the withdrawal of U.S. forces in 1973. In 1975, communist forces seized control of Saigon, ending the Vietnam War, and the country was unified as the Socialist Republic of Vietnam the following year. Here are some statistics from the Vietnam War. 2.5 million Americans served in Vietnam from 1956 through 1975. One third of those were drafted, the remaining two thirds enlisted. There were 11,000 women who served in Vietnam in various capacities. 12.5% of those who served were African Americans. 85% were white Americans. The average age of those that served was 22 years old. Compare that to World War II, where the average age was 26 years old. In World War II, soldiers experienced 40 days of combat over their four years of conflict. In Vietnam, however, the average soldier experienced 240 days of conflict in one year. One in 10 who served in Vietnam were either killed or wounded. 58,220 U.S. service members also died in the conflict. To this day, there are still 1,700 MIAs, or missing in actions, still unaccounted for from this conflict. Estimates of the number of Vietnamese service members and civilians killed vary from 800,000 to 3.1 million. Some 200 to 300,000 were Cambodians, 20 to 200,000 Laotians. The next memorial you'll see on the right is a tribute to the Persian Gulf War that took place between 1990 and 1991. The memorial's theme is leadership with the words duty, honor, country depicts George H. Bush, the serving president, to his right, General Colin Powell, to his left, General Norman Schwarzkopf, and to his right, a statue of a female soldier honoring the first time women served in battle as frontline soldiers in an American war. Also known as Operation Desert Storm, it began when Saddam Hussein invaded his small, oil-rich neighbor, Kuwait, in the summer of 1990. Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein ordered the invasion and occupation of neighboring Kuwait in early August 1990. Alarmed by these actions, fellow Arab powers such as Saudi Arabia and Egypt called on the United States and other Western nations to intervene. Hussein defied United Nations Security Council demands to withdraw from Kuwait by mid-January 1991, and the Persian Gulf War began with a massive U.S.-led air offensive known as Operation Desert Storm. On August 6, 1990, President Bush dramatically declared this aggression will not stand. With the Iraqi forces poised near the Saudi Arabian border, the Bush administration dispatched 180,000 U.S. troops to protect the Saudi kingdom. In a sharp departure from American foreign policy during the Reagan presidency, Bush also organized an international coalition against Iraq. He convinced Turkey and Syria to close Iraqi oil pipelines. He won Soviet support for an arms embargo and establish a multinational army to protect Saudi Arabia. In the United Nations, the administration succeeded in persuading the Security Council to adopt a series of resolutions condemning the Iraqi invasion, demanding restoration of the Kuwaiti government and imposing an economic blockade. President George H. Bush's foreign policy team forged an unprecedented international coalition consisting of the NATO allies and the Middle Eastern countries of Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Egypt to oppose this Iraqi aggression. Although Russia did not commit troops, it joined the United States in condemning Iraq, its longtime client state. The Department of State orchestrated the diplomacy for this grand coalition's effective air campaign in January 1991, which was followed by Operation Desert Storm, a 100-hour land war which expelled Iraqi forces from Kuwait. 
after 42 days of relentless attacks by the Allied coalition in the air and on the ground, U.S. President George H.W. Bush declared a ceasefire on February 28th. By that time, most Iraqi forces in Kuwait had either surrendered or fled. President Bush's decision to liberate Kuwait was an enormous political and military gamble. The Iraqi army, the world's fourth largest at the time, was equipped with Exocet missiles, top-of-the-line Soviet T-72 tanks, and long-range artillery capable of firing nerve gas. But after a month of Allied bombing, the coalition forces had achieved air supremacy, had destroyed thousands of Iraqi tanks and artillery pieces, supply routes and communication lines, and command and control bunkers. Plus, they had limited Iraqis' ability to produce nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. Iraqi troop morale suffered so badly under the bombing that an estimated 30% of Baghdad's forces deserted before the ground campaign even started. The Allied ground campaign relied on deception, mobility, and overwhelming air superiority to defeat the larger Iraqi army. The Allied strategy was to mislead the Iraqis into believing that the Allied attack would occur along the Kuwaiti coastline and Kuwait's border with Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, General H. Norman Schwarzkopf, American commander of the coalition forces, shifted more than 300,000 American, British, and French troops into western Saudi Arabia, allowing them to strike deep into Iraq. Only 100 hours after the ground campaign started, the war ended. Saddam Hussein remained in power, but his ability to control events in the region was dramatically curtailed. The Persian Gulf conflict was the most popular U.S. war since World War II. It restored American confidence in its position as the world's sole superpower and helped exercise the ghost of Vietnam that had haunted American foreign policy debates for nearly two decades. The doubt, drift, and demoralization that began with the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal appeared to have ended. The last memorial you'll encounter on Soldier's Walk is probably one of the most iconic memorials in the park. It is a tribute to the War on Terror where America was attacked by terrorists on September 11, 2001. This memorial is a tribute to those that perished that day. There are several monuments in this memorial, most notably the Twisted Steel Beam, which was once part of the Twin Towers, acquired from New York City. To the right of the beam, you'll find a memorial made from black marble, with inscriptions that are sandblasted in incised letters, with gold lithochrome applied to the letters on a granite foundation. This memorial is a tribute to the Twin Towers and all of those that perished and served to help the survivors, including the New York Police Department and the New York Fire Department. It is loaded with historic facts about the building, how it was built, and statistics on the building that perished in this horrible tragedy. In the center of the memorial are two granite blocks depicting the Twin Towers, with an engraved marble monument in front of them with the inscription, 9-11-11. 2001, the day that changed America forever. To the left of the two towers, you'll find a monument to the attack on the World Trade Center. The information depicts historical facts and accounts of what happened that day in New York City. To the right of the two towers, there is another memorial made from marble, with inscriptions depicting the attack on the Pentagon. Here you'll find historical facts about the Pentagon and information on the people that perished in this horrible tragedy. On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 Islamic men affiliated with Al-Qaeda hijacked four airliners all bound for California. Once the hijackers assumed control of the airliners, they told the passengers that they had a bomb on board and would spare the lives of passengers and crew once their demands were met. No passenger and crew actually suspected that they would use the airliners as suicide weapons, since it had never happened before in history. The hijackers, a member of Al-Qaeda's Hamburg cell, intentionally crashed two airliners into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, killing 147 civilians and the 10 hijackers on board the airliners. At 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the north face of the North Tower, One World Trade Center, followed by United Airlines Flight 175, which collided with the South Tower, 2 WTC, just 16 minutes later. 
The world watched in shock as the scene developed. As emergency services and members of the public rushed to help, the unimaginable happened. Both towers collapsed with cataclysmic results. Of the 2,759 who were killed in New York on 9-11, including the 10 hijackers, many of the bodies would never be found. Those who escaped the buildings and the many who rushed to help simply stood watching the horror unfold as they were suddenly caught by a tidal wave of terror. A choking cloud of dust now raged across the city. Within 102 minutes, the famous New York skyline resembled a war zone and its residents left shell-shocked. Here are some facts associated with the Twin Towers. The North Tower was hit at 8.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The tower collapsed 104 minutes later at 10.29 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The South Tower was hit by United Flight 175 18 minutes later at 9.03 a.m. with 67 people on board. People that died this day came from 39 different states, the Virgin Islands, and 35 different countries. The youngest passenger was two years old on her first trip to Disneyland. The oldest was 82 years old. The New York Fire Department lost 343 firefighters, almost half of the number of on-duty deaths in the department's 100-year history. The New York Police Department lost 50 officers. 1.5 million hours over 261 days were spent removing the debris at an expense of $1.3 billion. Just 34 minutes after the second attack on the Twin Towers, American Airlines Flight 77 hit the west wall of the Pentagon, killing 70 civilians, 55 military personnel who were in the building, as well as 59 civilians and the five hijackers on board. At 10.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 93 crashed into a field in Pennsylvania. It is believed the White House may have been the intended target, but terrorists were overcome by brave passengers once they received mobile calls informing them of a similar hijackings in New York and Washington. All 44 people on board, 39 civilians, a law enforcement officer, and the four hijackers died. No flights had any survivors. A total of 2,977 victims and 19 hijackers perished in the attacks, making it the worst terrorist attack to ever take place on U.S. soil, and also the deadliest foreign attack on U.S. soil since the Japanese carried out a surprise air raid on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Because of the attack, the Authorization for Use of Military Force Against Terrorists, or AUMF, was made law on September 14, 2001, to authorize the use of the United States Armed Forces against those responsible for the attacks on September 11, 2001. It authorized the President to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future attacks of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Congress declared this is intended to constitute specific statutory authorization within the meaning of Section 5B of the War Powers Resolution Act of 1973. As you complete your journey down the walk and enter the Millennium Amphitheater, you will be greeted by General's Overlook perched high up on the hill. General's Overlook honors America's greatest military leaders, most of whom were five-star generals. General's Overlook features memorials and statues of Dwight D. Eisenhower, the tallest statue on General's Overlook, is a five-star general and supreme commander of the Allied forces in World War II. Eisenhower is depicted addressing the troops prior to the D-Day invasion of Europe. Left, there is a memorial statue of General Douglas MacArthur, another five-star general and commander of the Pacific Forces. MacArthur is depicted as he is wading ashore upon his re-entry into the Philippines. Right is the memorial statue of John Blackjack Pershing, commander of the Expeditionary Forces in World War I. Pershing is depicted as he is landing American forces on European shores to engage our enemies in World War I. 
To the right of Pershing, you'll see the memorial statue of General Ulysses S. Grant. Grant led the Northern forces against the South to victory in the Great Civil War. Next, you will see a statue and a monument to John Paul Jones, who has been credited as being the father of the U.S. Navy. Off to the left of Eisenhower, MacArthur, and Pershing memorials, you will find a memorial and a statue honoring General George S. Patton with his bull terrier, Willie, at the base. Patton is depicted giving orders to his troop at Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. General's Overlook also features the American flag at the top of the amphitheater and the five flags representing the five branches of service acting as a fitting backdrop to the end of the walk. The memorials at the top of General's Overlook are also adorned with two M114 155mm howitzers. The Overlook also features an F-16 jet, the first F-16 decommissioned by the U.S. Air Force. The F-16 is the plane flown today by the U.S. Air Force and is also featured in the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds. The F-16 is also flown by 25 of our allied nations. To the left of General's Overlook, you can't miss the F-16 that is mounted depicting its flight. The plane you are looking at is the first F-16 decommissioned by the United States Air Force and was brought to the park with the help of a local area veteran, retired Colonel Ralph Haynes, whose likeness is in the cockpit. The General Dynamics, now Lockheed Martin, F-16 Fighting Falcon is a single-engine, multi-role fighter aircraft originally developed by General Dynamics for the United States Air Force. Designed as an air superiority day fighter, it evolved into a successful all-weather, multi-role aircraft. Over 4,500 aircraft have been built since production was approved in 1976. The F-16 is highly maneuverable, supersonic, multi-role tactical fighter aircraft. It was designed to be a cost-effective combat workhorse that can perform various missions and maintain around-the-clock readiness. It is much smaller and lighter than predecessors, but uses advanced aerodynamics and avionics, including the first use of a relaxed static stability fly-by-wire flight control system to achieve enhanced maneuver performance. Highly nimble, the F-16 was the first fighter aircraft built to pull 9G maneuvers and can reach a maximum speed of over Mach 2. The F-16 has an internal M-61 Vulcan cannon and 11 locations for mounting weapons and other mission equipment. The F-16 is currently being used by active duty U.S. Air Force, Air Force Reserve, Air National Guard units, U.S. Air Force Aerial Demonstration Team, the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds, and as an adversary aggressor aircraft by the United States Navy at the Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center. The F-16's official name is the Fighting Falcon, but Viper is commonly used by its pilots. This is due to a perceived resemblance to a Viper Snake, as well as the Battlestar Galactica Viper Starfighter. The F-16 is also flown by 25 of our allied nations. Off to the right side, before you enter the Rotunda and Avenue of Heroes, you will be greeted by an M48 Patton Army tank, which was obtained through the efforts of two local veterans and citizens. The M48 was designed for combat in Europe against Soviet tanks. The M48 was an enhanced version of the M47 Patton or Patton II tank. The M48 was pressed into service in 1953. When first deployed, the M48 had state-of-the-art fire control systems. At the time, computers were mechanical, and a range of the target was provided by a stereoscopic rangefinder, which functioned similarly to the 35mm camera. The M48 Patton was a main battle tank that was designed in the United States. It was the third tank to be officially named after General George S. Patton, commander of the U.S. Third Army during World War II, who was one of the earliest American advocates for the use of tanks in battle. The M-48 served as the U.S. Army and Marine Corps' primary battle tank in South Vietnam during the Vietnam War. It was widely used by U.S. Cold War allies, especially other NATO countries, until the M-60 tank was developed and deployed. Nearly 12,000 M-48s were built from 1952 to 1959. A good crew was able to put the first round on target 90% of the time, but this required excellent teamwork and communication on the part of the entire crew. In peacetime qualification, it was possible to stop from a speed of 20 miles an hour, acquire the target, and get off a first-round kill at 2,000 yards in 7 seconds. 
Here are some of the specifics about the M48 patent tank. The hull length was 21 feet, with the gun forward, 30 feet 6 inches. The width was 11 feet 11 inches. The height was 10 feet 1 inch. The tank weighed 52 tons. The hull weighed 20 tons. The turret weighed 18 tons. The engine and transmission was 6 tons. The engine cover was 2 tons. The track, 2 tons each. And the basic load of 2 tons. The M48 patent tank had a range of 258 miles and a top speed of 40 miles per hour. By the mid-1990s, the M48s were phased out of the U.S. service, but yet many countries continued to use the M48 patent tank. Off to the left of the Millennial Amphitheater, there stands a memorial to Ronald G. Wanick. This memorial was designed and placed in the Memorial Park by his son Todd Wanick, President and CEO of Ashley Furniture Industries, Ashley employees, friends, and the city of Arcadia, Wisconsin. The statue was dedicated on August 12, 2011, and it was a complete surprise to Ron. All the design elements and the statute's placement within the park was kept secret from Ron until the date of the dedication. This statue honors Ron for his philanthropy and is one of the greatest industrialists in Wisconsin's history. Ron is the founder of Ashley Furniture Industries and he grew it from one small manufacturing plant in Arcadia, Wisconsin with 35 employees into an international manufacturing and retail giant. Ashley is the largest furniture manufacturer in the world with facilities throughout the United States and Asia. The company serves customers in 123 countries and through Ron's vision and talents, the Ashley Furniture Home Stores quickly developed into the largest furniture retailer in the United States. Ron's vision has provided opportunities to tens of thousands of employees and suppliers throughout the world. Ron was also one of the founders of the Arcadia Industrial Development Corporation. This eight-member team stimulated unprecedented growth within the city of Arcadia and the surrounding areas as they developed farmland into industrial, commercial, and residential neighborhoods. Over the years, Ron's company, Ashley Furniture Industries, became the primary economic engine of the area. Riding the back of Ashley's steady growth, Arcadia's employment base increased by 5,000 jobs in less than 40 years, and through annexations and developments, the total area within Arcadia's city limits more than doubled. This amazing transformation established Arcadia as the economic hub of the region. Ron's philanthropy, with the encouragement and support of his wife Joyce and family, touched many community projects, organizations, and causes throughout the western Wisconsin and beyond. One of their most notable civic contributions has been the creation, funding, and development of Arcadia's Memorial Park. Ron was born in Winona, Minnesota on May 19, 1941. A son of a tenant farmer, Ron moved many times, living in Winona, Utica, in Altura, Minnesota, before his move to Arcadia, Wisconsin in 1963. For the first nine years of his life, Ron grew up in a household with no electricity, and he didn't have the luxury of indoor plumbing until he was 12 years old. Ron worked on his dad's farms for many years before taking a job as a laborer at Winona Industries and their parent company, Red Wing Industries, a company that designed and built cabinets for televisions. Ron's hard work and his manufacturing innovations were quickly recognized, and he was promoted to shop foreman and eventually to superintendent. In 1970, he took over the plant, and it became Ashley Furniture. When Ron came to Arcadia to evaluate the existing Arcadia Manufacturing Building in 1970, he was faced with past plant closures and the loss of a couple hundred jobs, which had serious effect on the local economy. Houses were for sale at half of what they would expect to pay, and many of the employees had checks that bounced, and that experience was very evident everywhere in the community. Ron came to Arcadia July 1, 1970, and by August 17, 1970, he had started production. At the end of that year, Ron had the plant breaking even, including paying all startup costs. From there, the young manufacturing plant with 35 employees is now the largest furniture company in the world employing tens of thousands of people around the world with over $4 billion in sales.